Absolutely. Is that too low? No? Okay. So I think, I think being in the joint program, the, the big um, a thing that I learned was how to operate the system. And so it gives me a slight advantage over other speakers that, that come in. Can you guys hear me okay? Great. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the biomechanics of uh, fractures in the right wall jaw. And I entitled this talk The Achilles Jaw, um, sort of because the story of Achilles is one that's really familiar to all of us. You know, this big, hulking, admirable figure um, has, uh, has a weakness, a weak spot, and when it's hit, it results in, in some very tragic consequences. And that, um, that sort of uh, is a great segue into the story of the right whale. It's one that a lot of people, especially on Cape Cod, know very well. Um, this animal um, measures about 50 feet in length uh, at, 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 at maturity. And there are fewer than 400 remaining in the entire North Atlantic population. So this species is, cr is quite critically endangered. Uh, and their, their story actually begins a long time ago in terms of why they got their name. Uh, this animal was called the right whale because it was the right whale to hunt. Now whalers, when they went out uh, and, and tried to kill different whale species, noticed that this type of whale floated when it died, and so it was a lot easier to not lose your catch once it died, whereas other whales sink when they die. So obviously, this was a great target for them in terms of making sure that all their efforts uh, in, in terms of trying to capture and kill a whale were not in vain. And, and sort of that story led to where we are today uh, in general in terms of uh, uh, having a very low population level. So these guys were his, his hunted historically to the brink of extinction. Uh, and, that, and that story sort of continues today. We, we still see that in spite uh, uh, of the fact that these animals have been protected internationally uh, and, and extensively studied um, for, for many, many years, the population has failed to recover. And so we see headlines like um, uh, uh, the North Atlantic right whale in crisis uh, in terms of them not having this uh, increase in growth that's expected when you relieve uh, commercial, commercial whaling pressure on the species. And some of the reasons that we think the species is failing to recover include the fact that they're still actually being taken incidentally um, by vessels. So uh, vessel whale collisions are one of the, the, the big three reasons why the species is failing to recover. The others include uh, entanglement in fishing gear, which certainly uh, takes quite a few animals as well. And last but not least, there are some signs that there's uh, a highly variable reproductive output of this species. In fact, um, uh, uh, incredibly low levels in certain years. Uh, for instance, I think uh, the year 2001, there was only one calf produced by the entire population. And we certainly see many mature females, about a third of the population of mature females, that never have reproduced, and no one quite understands why. Um, well, my focus is sort of on, on the dead side of things, uh, which is unfortunate for Thanksgiving dinner conversation. Um, but in terms of what we know about right whale mortality, we've seen in the last 38 years, 70, 74 carcasses have been spotted um, out at sea, and se several of those have been retrieved. Uh, the Coast Guard uh, is, is one of our greatest resources in terms of trying to retrieve these animals once they're sighted dead. And the reason we want to retrieve them is so that we can perform post-mortem examinations on them. These are called necropsies. Um, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. And actually, we, we really love doing it because we can gather so much data from them, not only on um, why they died or how, how they may have died, uh, but also how they, how they grow. Uh, and, and different uh, morphological features of these whales that you can only see from the inside out. Uh, we also gather uh, excellent statistics in terms of how, um, what the causes of death are uh, from these animals. And in fact, over the past 38 years, of the 42 carcasses that we've examined post-mortem, 64% of those uh, resulted from anthropogenic mortality. So that's man-made man or, or, or human-induced mortality. 19% were some type of neonatal death, and we're not really great at diagnosing those. Those can be um, bacterial infections, it could be some kind of birth defect, um, but the, the commonality is that they all died extremely, extremely young, and, and there's no known cause. And last but not least, the other big category is, is this big swath of undetermined. Um, we, and we certainly uh, can break that down a little bit further. 
14% of these animals have become entangled in fishing gear, and 50% of the ones that we've looked at have died as a result of ship strikes. Now, I'll tell you a, a, a little um, asterisk to these data are that animals that are entangled in fishing gear can remain entangled for up to a year um, before they, they sometimes die. And what often happens is they'll get wrapped up quite bad, sometimes around the rostrum, and sometimes their feeding is impaired. So that leads them um, to lose weight and sort of metabolize the, the large blubber stores or fat stores that they have. They lose weight and they lose that buoyancy uh, that, 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 that fat gives them. And so they're no longer the right whale because they won't float when they die. Um, and, and so we often know we're losing some of those in terms of our counts here. So this is uh, somewhat skewed, but it is our, our minimum number and our minimum estimate of how these animals are dying. Now on the other side of things, ship strikes often kill animals extremely quickly. And so they're, they're left in great body condition, still able to float, and so are probably sighted a lot more um, than those uh, animals that were entangled in fishing gear and sunk. Okay. With that being said, the story is still uh, particularly dire when you see 50% of your animals are being lost to ships. And we break that down a little bit further, and we see that about half of those are, are dying as a result of propeller trauma, and the other uh, half are dying as a result of blunt trauma or, or an actual impact with a ship. And I'll, I'll get into the details of that, the gory details of that later. So that's a, that's a warning for anyone that, that might be a little bit skittish of the, the images that you're about to see. They're not all pretty, and I'm glad it's happening before dinner. So this is sort of where, where my story and my involvement in right whales begins. Um, <coughs> when I uh, came to grad school, I was working on a project with Michael Moore, my advisor, and he studies right whales. And the first opportunity that I had to go out to right whale necropsy occurred in the fall of 2003. Um, he basically rounded up most of the lab, and we went up to Digby, Nova Scotia um, to wrangle a 50-ton uh, mature female right whale that was sighted uh, in the, the Bay of Fundy. So um, I, I won't get into the logistics of how one lands a whale, um, but, but I know it quite well at this point. And, uh, and I, I can tell you, it was quite an incredible experience. Um, and it left, left me with my first question, uh, first of two, two important questions that came, uh, found their way to me in grad school. The first of which was, you know, how did this whale die? And so what we do uh, during a necropsy, necropsy is we take a look at the external features uh, and internal structures uh, of the whale, determine what's sort of normal, what's abnormal, uh, and, and try and figure out what may have contributed to the death of this animal. Uh, well, with this animal in particular, right whale 2150, we found there was no evidence of human interaction, so no entanglement in fishing gear uh, externally. Didn't look like she had been hit at all. There were no obvious gross lesions, uh, skin lesions, or any, any type, anything that gave us any cause for concern. Uh, and in fact, we, we actually finished um, necropsing the entire back of the animal and then started in on the head. And when we finished the, 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 the postcranials or the, the rear of the animal, we, we found almost nothing um, grossly abnormal, uh, save for some minor swelling overlying the mandible. And back to that question of how this animal died. Uh, so then we looked inside. So here's that evidence of swelling. You can see it's sort of dark and discolored in this picture that was provided by Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, who actually found the whale uh, a few days before we got there. So it's slightly swollen on the right-hand side. And when we looked underneath that, what we can see um, is some, some swelling and hemorrhage in the blubber layer and in the muscle layer overlying the jawbone. And then we looked a little deeper, and sure enough, we found uh, this jawbone was completely fractured. So it had a complete transverse fracture of this 14-foot bone that, uh, that sort of tapers down to a point, but at certain points is about a, a foot uh, in diameter. So this is a pretty large structure, um, and I can tell you in terms of, of moving it, um, it weighs about 400 pounds, uh, so they're, they're pretty substantial. So you just have to think in your mind how, how hard something must have been hit in order to break that. Okay. Um, the other thing that we also found was a black tarry substance sort of uh, coating and infiltrating all over in the thoracic cavity. Uh, and it seemed very similar to blood sausage, if you've ever seen that, um, which is sort of cooked blood. And so that led us to believe that there was some kind of trauma um, to the thoracic cavity also um, uh, that, that resulted in the presence of that black tarry substance. Now back to the head again. The other thing that we found 
uh, was a catastrophic skull fracture. And so um, just to orient you on this picture, this is the rear of the skull. You're looking at the base of the skull um, with the, the top of the animal's head is on the ground. The bottom of the am animal's head is facing up. And my advisor's knife is pointing through the foramen magnum, which is where your, your spinal cord um, goes into your, into your brain. Okay? And the notable feature here is this three-foot crack or fracture down the back of the skull. Um, so certainly, uh, and, and it penetrated the brain case. So where the brain sits um, was, was actually opened um, by this fracture. So in terms of the cause of death for this animal, what we found were uh, 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 two skull fractures and also this fracture to the jawbone uh, and a lot of soft tissue trauma uh, associated with those injuries. We uh, performed some post-necropsy lab tests and found out the animal was not exposed to high levels of harmful algal blooms or biotoxins that are produced by them. And we also uh, performed histology on some of the tissues that we took and found that the jaw fracture um, actually showed some signs of healing. So there's a different type of bone found there um, that's not usually found in typical healthy bone that's not healing. Um, so that sort of led us to believe that that jaw may have been fractured and the animal may have had some small amount of post-survival time afterward and may have actually been hit a second time, which, which uh, fractured, fractured the base of the skull. But the bottom line is whether it was one ship or two, um, uh, the, the animal was likely hit, uh, hit by a vessel. Uh, and the blunt trauma injuries that we saw are what indicated that um, to us. They were just so extensive, uh, and the severity of those injuries has been previously associated with vessels, um, uh, vessel collision strikes that have been witnessed. So um, we, we have very, very high level confidence that this animal was struck by at least one ship. Now the second question that found its way um, during what found its way to me during grad school came courtesy of um, Moira, Dr. Moya Brown of the New England Aquarium. She's been studying right whales um, probably longer than I've been alive. And uh, she asked me, well, when I was explaining to her this necropsy experience I had and how we, we found out this animal had been hit by a ship, she, she asked me, well, what does it take to produce those injuries? What does it take to break a whale? And at the time, I had been working on a completely different project in right whales, had written my thesis proposal to then do three more years of work on this other wonderful project. And literally in two weeks, I changed my entire research program and decided I wanted to answer Mo Brown's question. And so that's what I spent the next three years doing. Uh, and, and so with the uh, incredible assistance of my advisor, Michael Moore, and uh, a whole swath of engineers, including Igor Sukroff, uh, at the University of New Hampshire. We put our heads together and came up with a research plan that would allow us to answer these questions. Now, I can't tell you how vital these engineers were um, to, this <laughs> to this endeavor, um, my math skills not being um, the, the, the best in the world, uh, but they certainly uh, um, um, uh, did a great job um, with their, their portion of the project. Now, um, I, I can also tell you that there's in, inherent difficulty in getting biologists and engineers speaking the same language. Uh, and so after a few months of, of uh, working, working on that issue, we became completely competent in each other's language. Uh, so I now am ESL engineering as my second language. And, and we, we have made a lot of progress on this project. So putting our heads together, we figured out that the, the, the best way to study this really was to create what's called a numerical model of vessel whale collisions. And that's sort of a simulation of a collision between a vessel and a whale. And you can think of some simple examples of numerical modeling. Um, the video games that you, might, um, that you might play are an example of that, where we take real world data on how fast a car might be going, what direction it might be going, what obstacles might be in its way, and what might happen when those obstacles hit the car. Okay? Uh, and we, we do this also when we, when we test uh, for safety factors for, uh, for the cars that we drive. And with things like that video game or the crash test, test dummy, dummy simulator, what you do is you input real data um, from, from some type of testing. You input uh, parameters such as the size of the car, the mass of the car, the speed the car is going, what direction it's going, uh, the size and location of different obstacles that are around. Uh, and you also input the material properties of any of your objects in your model. And the material properties are an inherent quality of whatever material you're studying, whether it's bone or concrete or a spring 
or a car windshield or a car bumper, you figure out how it reacts or how it behaves when it's, when it's hit. Okay. And then the outputs from a model like this, um, uh, you take that realistic data and you compare whatever inputs you want to put in to the outputs of your realistic data and you can come up with answers such as how, uh, how much speed is sufficient to cause damage if my car hits a tree. Okay? Certainly if you're, you're going along slowly it's very clear to see that you'll cause a lot less damage than if you're going along very quickly and you run into that, that uh, telephone pole. And you can also model not only what happens to the car but also what happens to the object that it hits. And you can look at that, you can ask very specific questions about the damage that's incurred including was the em engine damage beyond repair or can that car still effectively move in some way. And so this is sort of the setup for what we wanted to do with our whale and vessel collision model too. We wanted to, to figure out what type of damage we were looking for that would spell certain death for the animal and, and, and provide the appropriate inputs to get the outputs in terms of whether or not um, a vessel going a certain speed was going to kill a whale. Um, so together we came up with a, a whole suite of things that we needed to do to effectively model this. Okay? The first thing we needed to do was determine what type of injuries were common to whales that were killed by ships. We wanted to um, evaluate and choose one particular uh, injury that we felt was appropriate for modeling. And we wanted to determine what parameters we needed to input, um, what do we have to tell our model um, in order to get it to tell us what would happen to our, our ship and our whale. And last but not least, we wanted to put all these in uh, and, and let the numerical model do its thing and tell us um, how the bone behaves and, and, uh, and what's going to happen to our whale and what happens during a collision scenario. So addressing that first point, what injuries were common to ship strikes? Uh, common to ship struck animals. Um, this was actually the, uh, one of the most fun parts of my thesis. I had a chance to look over all the necropsy records for all the animals that have been looked at and, and pour through literature and try and categorize all the injuries that were seen in whales that were hit by ships. And uh, they fall into two basic categories, sharp trauma and blunt trauma. Now sharp trauma uh, includes all the wounds that result from contact between a whale and a turning propeller. And these, uh, these propellers then make um, what are known as chalk wounds, which are a combination of an incision and a, and a laceration. So you've got your turning propeller moving across black skin of a right whale, and it produces uh, either Z-shaped or S-shaped um, wounds, and that depends on the, the particular um, propeller um, that, that actually hits the skin. So a typical case, sadly, a, a typical place, t case of sharp trauma uh, was this juvenile male that, um, that showed up um, right before the turn of the year in 2006 down in Florida. Um, and so I'm sure my advisor was looking forward to a vacation in Florida in the winter, um, but not like this. Uh, so this, this animal, I think this animal was about uh, 20 feet in length, uh, and you can see all these parallel uh, Z-shaped uh, uh, chop wounds along the length of the animal. Uh, now, what you also notice is there's a lot of blood in the water, and that's typically associated with these, uh, these propeller injuries. They're highly variable, though. Um, many of them um, will, will hit the flukes, some of them will hit the body, uh, and others, uh, this whale up here uh, on the left was actually uh, named Lucky. She was uh, found struck by a ship. She had three propeller lacerations uh, to her flank as a, um, a young of the year. So she was just born, a brand new calf, and she was found with these really deep propeller injuries. And nobody thought she had a chance of surviving. Sure enough, she was seen up in the Bay of Fundy um, a few months later with her mom. She was healing and, and was a very well-tracked animal for the next, fo next 14 years. And then she showed up on a beach in this condition. And what had happened was her wounds had healed just fine, uh, and then she got pregnant. And so girth expansion from pregnancy, we think, um, expanded and opened up her wounds. And so we have the first case of uh, the long-term effects of a ship strike uh, in, in the population. So this is certainly the animal that it took the longest for, it, for a ship to, to finally do it in. Uh, so in general, what I found was that sharp trauma injuries, uh, we see a lot of soft tissue damage. We also do see the propeller can penetrate into the bone as well. 
Um, but the, the trauma is quite variable, both in severity and depth. So it's not particularly great in terms of um, uh, uh, being able to predict the outcome. Many of these animals actually do survive uh, much lower level, uh, level, level sharp trauma. Then we move into blunt trauma. And this is trauma that results from the whale being hit by the hull or any other uh, thing that's protruding from the hull. Uh, and so what you see there is one of these huge bulbous bow tankers. And then on the right is a right whale. Um, so some of the blunt trauma injuries that I've seen are uh, intense hemorrhage and edema, so bruising and swelling uh, all along the body. Uh, this is from right whale 2150, so this is a schematic of where the hemorrhage was found. Um, uh, actually, no, it's right whale uh, 1004, uh, where the hemorrhage was found on her body, uh, and the rest of the images are from right whale 2150. Oh. Uh, so, so what we do see are fractured um, mandibles, fractured skull. We'll see fractures in the vertebrae and also disarticulation of the ribs from the, um, the spinal <coughs> column and um, disarticulation of the vertebrae from one another. Um, those are quite typical of blunt trauma uh, as, uh, along with some of those, the soft tissue damage. But in general, we almost never see any external evidence of the injuries that we're going to find when we open up the animal. So there's some stereotypical fractures seen, and we also get a lot of bruising and disarticulation of ribs and vertebrae. So we, we've categorized all the injuries that we've seen in these whales killed by vessels. Now the next um, point was to choose which uh, injury we thought was great for modeling. Uh, and what we determined was that fracture, being a binary condition, it's either, something's either fractured or not, is a really, really great injury to model. And so we looked at all the different um, uh, bone types that were seen fractured and determined that the uh, fracture of the mandible or the jawbone is, is a really great uh, injury for our numerical model, uh, in part because it's found fractured in about a third of the cases of, of blunt trauma um, uh, due to ship strike. We've never seen a fully healed jaw either, so it's more than likely uh, indicative of the fact that this type of injury spells uh, fatality or, or, or is, is fatal for the animal. It's got a relatively simple geometry um, compared to more complex structures like the vertebrae or the vertebral column as a whole and the skull. And it also has relatively thin soft tissue protection. So on top of this jawbone lies about 20 centimeters of soft tissue, um, some muscle uh, and a small amount of connective tissue and epidermis. And that's in contrast to the west, rest of the whale where um, uh, the blubber layer alone uh, overlying, say, your vertebral column measures 20 centimeters, and then you also have plenty of muscle underlying that as well. So those structures are far more protected uh, than this jawbone is. And last but not least, I just happen to have over a ton of it in the freezer, and that's how you need to store it uh, to do some of the testing uh, that, we, that we had to do uh, for the next step. So it's, it's awfully great to have a freezer space at Hui uh, and also samples um, that we've collected in anticipation of this. So um, one, of the, one of the really inter interesting things about my project is I started it at a time where uh, a few right whales a year were coming in. And then um, with that first whale whose necropsy I went to, um, that was the beginning of one of the highest rates of right whale deaths um, in the past 30 years. So I just happened to come in at the right time in order to collect samples and then Luckily for the species, they stopped dying off so quickly. So it was just, just enough time for me to get my samples, and then, um, and lo and behold, that, that rate actually dropped right afterward. So I, I ended up having um, uh, six jawbones at my disposal from mature female right whales that all died about the same time. So the next step was then to determine what my input parameters were for the model. What did the model need to know in order to do its job? And there were two basic things that we needed to input into the model. The first was some information about um, the right whale mandible itself or the whole whale itself. Um, we wanted to look at the morphology of that jawbone, mostly because no one had really done it before, and also look at the material properties or how the bone tissue in the jawbone um, actually behaved and how it compared to, uh, to other animals. And, and last but not least, we needed a lot of information on the vessels that are out there in uh, right whale critical habitat. So my job was really to take a really close look at the mandible. 
I looked at the soft tissue protection overlying the mandible, and the basic story there was there's not a lot of it. Um, I did I also performed mechanical tests um, of the soft tissue to determine what that bumper or how that bumper actually behaved when it was struck. The next thing I did was looked at the physical properties of the mandible and finally the material properties. So the physical properties are things like the density of the bone, the shape of the bone and geometry, what it looks like outside, what it looks like inside, and then the material properties, as I mentioned, are how the bone actually behaves. So to get at the external geometry, um, I performed a three-dimensional laser scan of the entire jawbone. And, and you, you ask, how, how does one go about doing that? Well, you close off a Huey parking lot down the street, you get a crane, and you hang up this 14-foot bone, uh, surround it with this three-dimensional laser uh, setup, and watch out for coyotes, because they certainly did come too. Uh, so from that, we were able to determine um, the, the exact external geometry, and that provided a really critical input uh, for our numerical model uh, of this jawbone. The next step was looking at the internal structure, and the way we did that was using computed tomography. And so the computed tomography is simply what you, what you see is a, a medical scanner um, that um, you, you would see in a typical hospital setting. Uh, you, we laid the, laid the jawbone down on the table and allowed it to go through the scanner, and it provides you with information regarding um, the relative density of the bone. Um, so what you see here is a cross-section through the mandible. I wish I had my pointer. So you see a cross-section through the mandible. This is the, the dorsal surface, or the top, um, and this is the ventral surface, or the bottom of that jawbone. And um, in, in a computer tomography scan, high density bone or high density anything will show up bright white and lower density substances show up uh, gray or, or even uh, air is black. And so what you'll notice is there's bright, a bright white external uh, layer of bone and then this more porous, less dense layer of bone on the inside. That high density bone is called cortical bone and that, uh, that internal bone uh, that's very porous and of lower density is called trabecular bone. The other thing you'll notice is that there's a hole in the middle, and it's got um, some tiny, tiny uh, little circles in it. And, and much to my surprise at the time, um, the entire length of the mandible had a tube running down it, and that's typical of all mammalian jaw bones. They have this tube running uh, uh, lumen, it's called the mandibular um, canal, and it's how the vessels and the nerves that feed the face um, make their way down the jaw. Okay. So certainly it was a surprise to me because this hole was large enough to me, for me to stick my arm down it, and that's not typical, <laughs> typical of mammals. Um, so in, in, in a typical mammal, what you'll see is that cortical bone on the outside, and it doesn't grade at all, but is uh, highly demarcated uh, between this high-density bone and this low-density bone. You can see there's an abrupt line um, between the two. And in the right wall jawbone instead, we see some gradation where you see his high density bone gradually getting lower in density. And that's very different from what we see in any other uh, mammal at all. Now the next thing I wanted to do was look at the bone density. And I didn't just want to do this to report on bone density in general, but bone density is often related to uh, and correlated to the material properties of a bone. So if you can determine the density, oftentimes you can look in the literature for these relationships between density and how that bone is going to behave. Higher density bone is often stiffer and stronger than lower density bone. And so once I knew the bone density, I thought, well, it might be nice to be able to not have to do these me mechanical tests um, if, it, if, it, if it turns out it's not possible and be able to sort of extrapolate from other mammalian species where this work has already been done relating density to how it will behave. And I did that using a technique called quantitative computed tomography. Uh, and that's just a fancy way of saying I put um, samples of known density uh, into the machine at the same time. And that allowed me to determine what the bone density was at many, many different points in this huge 14-foot bone internally without destroying the bone and having to measure it, um, measure the density itself. So it was great in terms of um, my project, it being able to get the data that I needed. Uh, and also great because I could return the mandible to the museum that it's going to eventually go to without too many holes in it. So what did I find when I looked at the density? Well, going from the, the back of the ramus of the jaw, which is back here, it's what articulates with the temporomandibular joint, 
to the front of the jaw, which is uh, the, the chin end, I found that the density of the, the jaw bone, both cortical bone, which is shown in dark blue, and trabecular bone, which is shown in light blue, increases steadily as you go along the jawbone. And the stars just indicate um, each of the sections that are statistically significantly different from all the other sections. Uh, so for the most part, that is a, an increasing trend in density and more than likely strength uh, and stiffness as you move along the jawbone. And the last thing I wanted to look at was the actual tissue microstructure or what the bone looked like um, up close and personal. Now on the left, what you'll notice this is an x-ray of that trabecular bone or that really highly porous bone. And it looks like typical trabecular bone that we'd find in a cow or a human, um, in a femur or anything else. The, the trabeculae or these bony struts are about 0.1 millimeters, I'm sorry, are about, about a millimeter um, no, they're 0.1 millimeters in, um, in width in a typical trabecular bone. Now, when I looked at that intermediate bone or the bone along that density gradient, what I found was the trabeculae were much, much bigger. They were about 10 times bigger and were almost a millimeter um, in diameter. And that's very atypical for trabecular bone. You just don't see trabecular bone like that. The other thing you notice, aside from the thickness of these trabecular struts, um, was it that there were, there were also much larger pores as well in this bone. Um, and, and as far as I can tell, it, this has not been seen anywhere in any other um, type of bone. Uh, so in terms of the findings from this portion of the study, what I found was that there's relatively simple external geometry to this bone. It was incredibly low density, so you have this low density trabecular bone and a lot of this low density uh, intermediate bone. Um, the, there was a cross-sectional gradient in density. We saw the cortical bone on the outside, this intermediate bone grading into this really low density trabecular bone in the center of the bone. And then I also noticed a caudocranial bone density gradient. That just means that from the back of the bone to the front of the bone, it got um, a lot more dense. And last but not least was that surprise bone, that intermediate bone, um, that has never before been found uh, in any other animal. And certainly in terms of the, the the, all these physical properties will certainly influence how that bone is going to behave uh, biomechanically and thereby during a collision. Well, the next step was to determine what the material properties of that bone were, how stiff it was, how strong it was, and whether or not it displays a property known as anisotropy. And that just means if it's loaded from different directions, does it behave the same or does it behave differently? If a substance is anisotropic, that means it behaves um, differently when it's loaded in different directions. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to figure out were whether certain regions of the bone uh, were, were prone to failure. And so I decided to actually perform these experiments in the bone uh, itself because there were so many things that were different about this bone than the other bone that has already been explored, such as cow and, and human and, and rabbit bone. So I couldn't rely on information from studies that have already been, um, uh, been conducted because this bone and whales in general are just so different. Um, that it really didn't make sense to, to rely on that. So what I did um, was drilled holes in that large uh, jawbone and took samples um, that were about uh, seven, 7 millimeters across and uh, 10 to 12 millimeters high. And these were cylinders of bone that were then compressed between two metal plates. Okay? And this is called uniaxial compression testing. And this can tell me a lot about how that bone's going to behave um, when, it's, when it's struck by a vessel. Um, from these tests, I was able to determine um, the force per unit area that was applied to the bone and also how much the bone deformed. And those two, two properties are called uh, the stress that was applied to the bone and the resulting strain. Uh, and then I was also able to calculate two material properties, Young's modulus of elasticity, which is the stiffness of the bone, and also the ultimate strength, or basically the breaking point, the breaking strength of this bone. And I did this along three different axes. And each of these axes represents a different direction that a vessel is going to be able to hit a whale. So a front-long collision re was, is represented by the x-axis. A side-long, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a collision to the bottom of the, from the bottom of the chin is represented by the y direction. And a collision from the side is represented by the z direction. You ask, how might an animal be hit from below? Well, these animals will often come up to the surface um, and, and sort of spy hop or look up. And, and they could potentially be hit. Um, from the chin in that direction. <laughs>
So first, I'm going to show you some data um, from the x-axis, or that, that front, front, front long collision in trabecular bone. So here's what the data look like when you squish a piece of bone. Um, basically, um, as, as you move along this axis, you're, you're uh, recording how much shorter the specimen's getting. And as you're moving along this axis, you're, re you're recording how much um, force per unit area you're applying, so how much, how much force you're applying. Sorry. Uh, and the, property, uh, the material property Young's modulus, so the stiffness of the bone, is just the slope of that line, so that yellow region, the slope of the linear region of that, um, the curve. And then the ultimate strength is the peak, or right where that, um, that sample is no longer responding uh, as, it, as it was while it's being loaded. <coughs> Uh, so here's just some representative data from the x-axis in red, the y-axis and the blue axis in, um, in blue and green, respectively. I performed over 95 different tests uh, in these different dimensions. So this is certainly a small portion of the data. And here's what I found. Uh, compared to data from a human mandible and a human femur, um, the y and the z-axis uh, are, are much, much less stiff uh, than those other, those other bone types, but the x-axis is not. The x-axis is about the same stiffness as a human mandible or human femur. Okay, so that's telling me um, two important things. One, this bone is behaving differently depending on the direction that it's being loaded. And two, that the, the strongest axis, or the, I'm sorry, the stiffest axis is actually on par with what we see in the human mandible or the human femur. When I look at the breaking strength or that ultimate strength, um, I find something, something else is quite interesting in terms of relating it to the human femur or the human, human mandible, sorry, the human mandible, the human femur. Um, the, the weaker axes are actually on par in terms of their breaking strength with these other, uh, other bone types. And, and that, um, that headlong collision or that headlong direction is actually much, much um, stronger uh, than, than any of these other bone types. Now, we do, we do something a little bit, um, a little bit tricky. We, we look at a stiffness to strength ratio, which tells us something about the total properties of this bone. And when we, when we look at the stiffness to strength ratio, we see that the x, y, and z axes all perform the same um, when, we, when we put all the material properties together. Um, and that they're, they are both, um, and, and that this ratio is much lower for all these axes than it, than it is uh, in the human mandible and the human femur. So that tells us um, that this bone is particularly, um, particularly weak when we look at all of its material properties at the same time. Now again, um, I, I told you that I wanted to perform these tests in, uh, in right whale tissue because right whales are so different from other species. So what I wanted to do was take a look at um, other bone types uh, in the literature. So the black and white um, the black and white dots represent human bone in two different directions, so loaded in two different directions. And what I've done is I've, I've added my data to this plot, um, red still being consistent for that x-axis, the blue and the green still being consistent for the y-axis. And the difference in terms of um, how this bone behaves <coughs> is not that surprisingly different from human bone loaded in two different directions. Um, now, when I, when I did the same thing for the ultimate strength, looked at how the ultimate strength behaves depending on the direction of loading, I found that my y and my z axes, or the, 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 the uh, less stiff dimensions of the bone, behave um, very similarly to um, the human bone loaded in, the, in, the, in both directions. Okay? But my right well jawbone loaded from the front is a lot, a lot stronger um, than would have been predicted if I had gone, um, gone by... Uh, human bone as my as in my model. Um, oh, so it's the uh, ultimate strength um, versus the the strain on the bone. Or actually, no, I'm sorry. For this one, it's the density. Sorry, it's the density. So the density allows you to predict then um, where it's going to fall in terms of the strength or the stiffness. And so for its density, um, this bone is a lot a lot stronger than it would have than it than we would have predicted based on its density, based on many many tests in many many different species. Okay. Uh, so in general, uh, what I found was that the average stiffness to strength ratio that is 
typically 100 to 1 in all species. Like we, we, the average for all species is about 100 to 1 is very, very different in right whale bone. It's about, it's about a, a quarter of that. Um, and trabecular bone from right whales is a lot stronger in that one dimension than would have been predicted by its density, but in general is not nearly as strong um, overall. And that strength for that one direction is not due to, to an increase in mineralization. I also did additional testing to determine whether or not this bone was, was really highly mineralized and that allowed it to be stronger. The bone behaves differently when loaded in different directions. And the, there are two um, weaker axes, the Y and the Z axes, which, are, which um, uh, behave, um, they're a lot more compliant, or that's another, another way of saying that they're, they're weak um, compared to that other axis. So it's, it's about a quarter of the strength of the long axis. And when we think about what the Z axis represents, it represents the full 14 foot length of bone in this animal and presents a really large surface area in terms of collisions, far more surface area um, presented to, to a vessel um, than, than, say, that front-on collision. And so what we can do is we can take the behavior of the animal, which we know they often log at the surface, combine that with the biomechanics that we've looked at, and we can determine that a sidelong strike of a right whale, um, which is um, quite likely based on their behavior, would leave them quite open um, to, to fracture because this is the weakest um, direction of loading in this, in this jawbone. And so it actually does seem to represent somewhat of an Achilles heel um, for the species. So we've taken uh, animals on the beach, we've taken their parts into the lab and explored them quite in depth. And the question is, where do we go from there? Well, we go on to what, what we talked about, that numerical model. And some of the questions that can be answered with that, that numerical modeling that's, that's underway um, include, well, how does, how does the ship play a role in this? What are the stresses that a ship can generate, and how do they compare to what we did to the bone? And how much localized stress is enough to really fracture that whole mandible? And last but not least, can slowing ships down um, have, an, have an effect in terms of reducing uh, ship strike mortality in the species? Well, we knew going into this that, that some of these huge, huge ships out here um, combined with these relatively small whales uh, spelled bad news. And the, the bad news sort of continues. Every now and then we will get a whale. Um, but the good news from that is that we, we also gather a lot of data from them and we can learn a lot about them. And that management is really looking for clear data that tells us uh, whether or not slowing ships down uh, is going to be the key. And so in terms of that model, that necropsy data um, has been used to create this model. So we take a lot of measurements of whales on the beach, and, and those measurements have been turned into um, this numerical model of, of the whale by Jason Raymond up at the University of New Hampshire. Um, these are the relative dimensions of its uh, skeletal elements as well. And so he embedded that skeleton into this numerical model of the soft tissue. And he gave the properties of the soft tissue from the mechanical testing that I did. Um, he he uh, applied those to the soft tissue in the model. And then the um, material properties that I obtained from testing the bone, he uh, incorporated those into the model where the skeleton was found. And then, of course, you need the ship. So he used the front century ocean liner as a model ship. And when you compare that to the size of the whale, it's pretty dramatic. Uh, and then the next step was to run them into each other. Okay. And I can show you, if you'll bear with me for just a second, I can show you a five knot collision and a 15 knot collision. So what you're seeing is the ship moving in from the left and hitting the whale. That's at five knots, I'll play that one more time. And the colors are telling you how far from center that whale is being pushed. And that's actually very important, and I'm going to skip over the importance of that, but I'll tell you that in two seconds. Then we'll do the same collision at 15 knots. Oh, sorry, I'm having a little... Let me show you that again. Show you the same collision at 15 knots. Now, things are happening a little faster. Obviously, the, the um, soft tissue and eventually the skeleton are being pushed a lot faster um, and are actually, um, you'll notice... Um, there's a lot of deformation, oops, sorry, a lot of deformation of the soft tissue before the whale even starts to move. So look how far that, that bow has penetrated um, 
uh, penetrated the whale already before the whales even started to move. Now I'll show you that in this video. Let me back up for a second. So now Jason's taken the ship out of it. The ship is still going to move in, but it's invisible now, so you can see what's happening clearly. He's also um, removed from view the soft tissue. So now you're just going to watch what's happening to the skeleton during this collision. Look at that. There's your jawbone, and it's already bent to be in line with the vertebral column. And that's in a matter of um, one, uh, um, less, all of this happens in less than a Five, less than 0.5 seconds, less than half a second. Okay. All right. And then I'll show you one other interesting movie. And this one was one uh, that Jason did not actually, he didn't have to program any parameters to see this uh, or to, to make this happen. So let me tell you, tell you what's going to happen before it does. So here's the, the um, vessel approaching uh, again from the left. And there's your whale, okay? So, so you're just looking at it, looking at the whale's head. And you watch as the whale is hit by the bow and then hit again by the hull. And that explains some of the patterns that we see in terms of the hemorrhage and edema being on, uh, on, t on opposite sides of the animal uh, and sort of being rather otherwise inexplicable, okay? So now we'll go back. And I just have about another minute to finish up here. So the model sort of reveals some really interesting uh, things to us. It tells us the time scale of the collision, how fast all this is happening. It also tells us that the whale doesn't move much before the damage occurs, and that tells us that fluid drag is negligible, and that's a really big deal in terms of um, uh, it was one of the uh, assumptions of our model that fluid drag was negligible, and we've confirmed that the time scale allows us to make that assumption. It gives us an, an idea of the contact area, so Jason can take a look at the side of the whale that's affected um, by the ship, and we had no, no way of doing that before. Um, we can also look at the stress that's applied by a vessel of a given, given size, moving at a given speed. And the last thing, and one of the most important parts about this, is that this model clearly demonstrate that, demonstrates that there's a linear relationship between speed and the maximum force that's applied to a whale. And that's something that's been hot and, uh, hot and up for debate um, between managers and uh, lobbyists of the shipping industry. Time is money. They want to move as fast as is humanly safe and possible. Uh, and slowing them down um, reduces profits. And so certainly they've been lobbying not to necessarily have these speed restrictions. And without good data, management really couldn't um, uh, tell them that, that these speed restrictions were going to work and were, and were actually vital um, for uh, saving this species. And so this graph sort of sealed the deal for us in terms of being able to go in January and testify uh, to the National Marine Fisheries Service um, that's responsible for protection of right whales. Um, with these data behind us, I think um, we have the first biomechanical uh, data that demonstrates this link between speed and, and, um, and the severity of, of um, injury. So in conclusion, uh, what, I hope I sh what I hope I showed you is that mandibular fracture is an appropriate fatal injury for numerical modeling, uh, that, that we've been able to determine what the biomechanical properties of bone are and that these are then vital inputs for this numerical model, uh, real and true data on right whale bone tissue uh, itself. And last but not least, that numerical models can provide really important quantities that otherwise were unknown and, and oftentimes estimated uh, and, and basically guessed um, before. And so um, between our interactions with engineers and collaborators and now our further interactions with the National Marine Fisheries Service and other management entities, it's our hope that in spite of the fact that they do have this, um, this weak spot or this Achilles jaw, there's something that still can be done so that we don't end the right will story here, but that it continues. Okay. At, this at this time, I'd like to acknowledge the many, many people that have contributed to this project, um, often uh, in, in moral and academic support. Uh, my advisor, Michael Moore, Moira Brown from the New England Aquarium, Lorna Gibson, who is um, one of my committee members and is now the assistant provost of MIT, and John Muller at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, who helped me perform those mechanical tests. My UNH collaborators uh, include a host, of, a host of folks, including Ira Sucroff and Ken Baldwin, uh, Judson DeCue and Jason Raymond, and also um, three undergraduates who also contributed um, data to this project. Uh, and these are all my funding sources, uh, and they've been instrumental in accomplishing what we hope is a reasonable task.
At this time, I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Let me turn the lights up. How about giving them more calcium? More calcium for those bones? Well, we're not sure. So we don't think that there's any, any problem with their mineralization. We think that it's the structure, the microstructure itself that's, that's causing the weakness. And, and certainly, I think the issue is they're not evolved to deal with being hit by ships. And so there, there's really nothing we can do to, to change them. We need to change our own activities because that's what the problem is. Yes? So um, there's some behavioral evidence that they definitely can uh, hear ships coming and that given enough time, I, I've seen them react from 10 feet away from a vessel. We were standing still, we had a hydrophone off the back and this whale was sailing, uh, was swimming open mouth towards our hydrophone and we thought we'd be the first scientist that entangled the whale. And we watched it drop two feet away from the hydrophone um, and drop underneath it and, and you know, make us a lot less, <laughs> less nervous. So they, they are able to respond and react to things that are in their way. Um, we've seen them move away from ships, but the issue is there's so much noise in the water. It's like a cocktail party. You can only pay attention to certain things at certain times. Um, so, so there are people right now that are working on that issue and trying to figure out what the minimum detection distance is for a right whale. Um, it's a really complicated problem. And obviously, we can only tell what they're responding to, and not what they're capable of hearing. So, um, so it's pretty complicated. But the thought is that given enough time, they will be able to get out of the way. We know they react. So I think the key is just to give them more time. More time is always better. So, so there's two, two important issues with that. Um, and I'll give you an example of adding noise to the environment helping, and that's um, pingers on, on, um, on gill nets that are released. There are these small acoustic devices that allow harbor porpoises and other, other um, cetaceans to hear them and seals too. Um, so they have been effective at allowing these uh, animals to sort of move out of the way of these nets. Um, so, so it's a thought. We do think it can work. Now the other side is there's already enough noise in the ocean, um, so they may just become habituated to it. Um, now the third side of it is that a ship coming, a ship traveling forward, there's some evidence that there is a shadow, an acoustic shadow in front of the ship, such that the, the hull of the ship is actually blocking all the noise from behind from being heard right there. And if we think about it, whales are going to go to the quiet, well we, we've seen evidence that whales will go to the quietest spot when they're trying to avoid some kind of acoustic signal, and that's going to be right in front of the ship. So, you know, this is, it's a really complicated issue, and, and um, we, I think as scientists, we're um, comfortable trying different options, but we also don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot and be wrong. So we, <laughs> so we have a lot of trouble climbing out on that limb sometimes, um, but, but we think there are answers out there, and that's what we're going to keep searching for. Yes, John. When you do the, the model stuff, mm -hmm. the whale was stationary? Yes, so the, one of the assumptions was that the whale was stationary and at the surface. Yeah, so, so we will... We so because it seems to me that as, if you have the ship hit and penetrate some mm -hmm. whales or something, I mean, that's, a, that's a two different directional stress in a way. Right. So, so what we did was the, the simplest and also probably the most... Um, so, so the one thing is that the speed that the ship is going is almost always going to dwarf the speed that the whale is going. Whales, whales can travel, they can do burst speeds of seven knots. Um, so some of these hi the higher numbers that we've w that we've modeled stationary whales is, is usually the most reasonable. Um, the other thing is in terms of uh, glancing blows versus um, versus side long blows. We we wanted to take the um, um, the worst case scenario, which certainly is this one. And and so just removing whale behavior out of it was the easiest for us, as my engineers reminded me time and time <laughs> and time again. We don't want to deal with the behavior. Yes. 
We've also looked at additional, we've looked at 10, we've looked at 12, um, and so we can get these same parameters um, from all these different, these different speeds. Um, now actually, uh, Jason, Jason hasn't run the model at 12, I take that back, he's done 5, 10, and 15, okay? But we certainly have the capability to do that. Um, what, we, what we need now is more money to be able to then analyze the output from our, from our model. Um, so we are going to look at these relevant, the speeds that are relevant in terms of management and try and figure out, you know, just what, what, is, what works best. I also, I didn't tell you, we also did another model, um, which is of just the jawbone on its own and um, loading it um, to see how the jawbone as a whole responds. Uh, so this is another numerical model just based on the jawbone. And that one has, has um, given us some really interesting outputs in terms of telling us how, how much that stress penetrates into the bone, so not just at the surface, but also how much it penetrates into the bone. Uh, and we're finding um, the load that it takes to break, uh, to break the jawbone on its own without the whole whale being involved. Um, so that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty sweet project too. And we've also validated that. We've taken and strung up that, that whole 14-foot bone and then hung, hung weights from it, um, attached strain gauges to it to see just how um, that bone's responding. So we do have some real life validation of, of our modeling exercise. Yes? How about uh, putting the power support in place so to create the weight that will push the, the way up? Time is money. It's going to take more output of that ship to go through the yeah, water. Only, only for a short distance until they're, until they're, until they're past the, the whale? Where? The short distance before they get into the pole, in the bay area. Oh, no, no. These, th we've seen right whales um, being hit everywhere from Nova Scotia right down to Florida. So it, it's happening everywhere. And so something that was going to impede um, or, or even having a boat to monitor what's in front of it. I mean, and, and sea conditions are just such that most of the time you can't see these guys. We'll go out looking for them, and, and we can't see them. They certainly don't make the displays that we see in Cape Cod Bay. Uh, and in the Bay of Fundy all the time. A lot of times they're just laying at the surface, they're black, they're flat, and you know, it's, it's a, it looks like a navigational hazard. You know, you really, one of those, you know, you just, you just can't see them at all. So even having dedicated spotters, you, you can't see them. And some of the vessels that are out there do have dedicated marine mammal um, spotters in, in particular areas. So sometimes you just, you just can't see them. So we know that people aren't hitting them on purpose. <laughs> we, we certainly recognize that fact, and we recognize that it would be very hard to implement some type of program that would allow people to, to try and spot them. They're, they're, you're just not going to be able to see them in fog and any kind of weather and any kind of wave action. It's really difficult. Yes? Uh, so you mean permanent tags? So as far as I know, there are no permanent tags on the population right now. We do have um, some uh, folks uh, out of Woods Hole and also out of University of Washington, I think that do uh, detagging, which are temporary suction cup tags that stay on the animal for you know, anywhere from uh, on the order of hours to maybe a couple days. Um, so one um, idea that was brainstormed by some scientists was why don't we put AIS tags on the 400 whales and make ships think they're going to run into a, a ship. Uh, and I think, I think it's, a, it's a very good idea. I don't know how we'd accomplish that. Um, there, there, there's been some work done on invasive tags, which are the ones that get stuck underneath the skin. Um, and I'm not particularly comfortable with that, um, but, but it, it has been done. So I suppose it is a possibility, um, uh, although I'd hate to, I, hate, I hate to be a sea captain that would all of a sudden see a, a boat appear <laughs> as they're, yeah, as they're, as they're um, driving, yeah. No, so, so I've studied, so I've done the CSI type forensic study, and, um, and I, you can't tell the direction of the collision based on um, where they were hit. It certainly was on that side um, of, of the animal, um, but in terms of the, the angle of attack, no, I, no, it's a, it's a clean break every single time, and in fact, um, every time, every time it's been about a meter from the front which is really weird considering my data tell me that that's the, the most dense area. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on with that, but it's also the, the, uh, the narrowest area. But bone is supposed to break where it's weakest, and it's not there. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's going on with those. That's still a mystery to me. Yes? 
Mm-hmm. No, it's definitely not. A, it, it's it's definitely not all the same type of ship. That's not at all what we want to imply. Um, that's one of the reasons we've changed from um, speaking of these as ship strikes to vessel whale collisions because it could be any vessel out there that's big enough and moving fast enough that causes damage. So I don't by any means want to say that it's only container ships or, or freighters out there that are doing this damage. Um, I'm, I'm, we, we have seen fishing boats that have killed humpbacks before. Um, so it could be any, anywhere from a, you know, a lobster boat right on up, I think, is, is probably where, where we would put our focus. Ah, so with the humpback, we could tell um, uh, because the paint chips were still on the animal. It was one of the freshest animals that we got in, and there was still blue paint on the animal, and it had been seen feeding near two particular um, fishing vessels, one of which was blue, um, within hours of it showing up there. So sometimes we, we get really lucky, and that you know 30-minute CSI show does, does actually happen. But for the most part, what ends up happening is they're hit, and before we get a hold of them, They've been floating out at sea for seven to nine days, so we're not dealing with the freshest material. Um, things like their baleen will, will fall out over time, uh, and their tissues degrade. So a lot of the information that we could get from a really fresh specimen, we just don't have access to. <coughs> no, so these guys don't, and that's one of the reasons we have really good confidence um, that, that it's not another whale that's doing this breaking. Um, but in terms of their, their bone density increasing toward the front, that's what, that's what we see in our, in our, in our jaws too. Uh, and that's what I've seen in, in other mammals too. And so the question is, these animals don't chew. These are baleen whales. They, they filter feed. Um, so it's, uh, bone generally will remodel and change itself according to the stresses that, that it feels. So if you're, if you're a runner, you're going to have much stronger bones than me because I don't run. Um, at least your, your femur is going to strengthen to deal with the impact. Um, and so the thought is that um, mastic an animal that chews or masticates would, would stiffen its bone in the, in the area that it's chewing. Um, but these guys don't chew, so I kind of don't know what's going on. It may just be that all, all jawbone developed the same way. I'm just not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're, they're really streamlined too, so that water, is, it, it doesn't form intense pressure. When we see, so there's two different feeding styles for baleen whales. Your humpbacks and animals like that will gulp feed, so they take in this huge amount of water, they close their mouths, and then they um, push the water out. So they're dealing with really, really big forces from that, from that water. These guys don't. They're skim feeders. They open their mouths, and they kind of plow through the water, and the water goes back out the other side. So they're not dealing with the intense forces either. So I, what I'd love to do is the next study is see if humpbacks and right whales have different, um, different uh, uh, bone density structure in their jaw and compare how, how, how that might in be influenced by their feeding hydrodynamics. Mm -hmm. I, so, so I'll uh, have to give you another asterisk, and that, that is that all my bone d data is from a single animal. Okay? And that's great for right whale research. It wouldn't work with human research very well. Um, but so I have no idea how that's going to be affected by age. So certainly we see um, loss of, of uh, calcium and mineral as we age in terms of humans and dogs and other animals. Um, but we, we just don't know with these guys. And, and in fact, one of the things that I, that I thought um, was that we'd see pregnant or females that had been very successful being pregnant um, losing calcium and losing mineral. But it turns out that's not even true in humans, that it's actually really temporary and that your dietary calcium um, can re re replace your calcium stores just fine. So we don't even expect to see a difference in calcium uh, or mineralization as they age. There's less than 400 in this. In this. Ah, so that's the aquarium's uh, really neat uh, numbering scheme. So they knew there were a lot of animals out there. Um, and so they made up this, this numbering scheme that was, let's see, I'm trying to remember. It was based on when the animal was found, uh, and the last two digits signified something else. And as they got over a certain number of animals, that started to fall apart. So that's just a legacy system, and now they're just numbered kind of sequentially. So what they were doing was numbering a female a certain number, and then all her calves were like 2151, 2152. But you know, as they get more calves, or as somebody else is born, it just it started breaking down. <laughs>
So I think I think there've been I want to say about 600 animals in the catalog altogether, but I'm not I, don't quote me on that number. And and many of those obviously have have passed on. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Yes. Um, right now, I'm a postdoctoral investigator with Sharon Swartz in a bat lab, surprisingly. So they study bat biomechanics in flight, um, and they endure me quite well. They actually love, <laughs> they love whale stuff there. And I'm also teaching uh, comparative biology of the vertebrates, a senior lecture lab class this semester. So that's sort of occupying my time now. And in fact, tomorrow, we're, we're dissecting dolphins up there at Brown. So. How long, how, how much time is it um, I'm, I, I, for the past, Seven months, I haven't been at Huey very, very often during the week. I'll come down during the weekends to, to do my work, but I can do my work remotely quite often. Yeah. Thank you, guys. It's really nice to be able to talk to people that talk back because my juniors and seniors don't, all, <laughs> don't always respond at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. So thank you. Have a great night. Thank <laughs> you.